Hello, I'm Mrs Johnson and I'm going to be reading you Paddington. Mr and Mrs Brown first met Paddington on a railway platform. In fact, that was how he came to have such an unusual name for a bear, because Paddington was the name of the station. The Browns were waiting to meet their daughter Judy when Mr Brown noticed something small and furry near the left luggage office. It looks like a bear, he said. A bear, repeated Mrs Brown, on Paddington Station. Don't be silly, Henry. There can't be. But Mr Brown was right. It was sitting on an old leather suitcase marked Wanted on Voyage. And as they drew near, it stood up and politely raised its hat. Good afternoon, it said. May I help you? Um, it's very kind of you, said Mr Brown, but, well, as a matter of fact, we were wondering if we could help you. You are a very small bear, said Mrs Brown. Where are you from? The bear looked around carefully before replying, Darkest Peru. I'm not really supposed to be here at all. I'm a stowaway. You don't mean to say you've come all the way from South America on your own, exclaimed Mrs Brown. Whatever did you do for food? Unlocking the suitcase, the bear took out an almost empty glass jar. I ate marmalade, it said. Bears like marmalade. Mrs Brown looked at the label around the bear's neck. It said, quite simply, please look after this bear. Thank you. Oh, Henry, she cried, we can't leave him here all by himself. There's no knowing what might happen next. Can't he come and stay with us? Stay with us, repeated Mr Brown nervously. He looked down at the bear. Uh, well, would you like that? He asked. That is, he added hastily, if you have nothing else planned. Oh, yes, replied the bear. I'd like that very much. I've nowhere to go and everyone seems in such a hurry. That settles it, said Mr Brown. Now you must be thirsty after your journey. Mr Brown, can you get some tea while I go and meet our daughter Judy? But Mary, said Mr Brown, we don't even know its name. Mrs Brown thought for a moment. Mm, I know, she said. We'll call him Paddington. After the station. Paddington, the bear tested it several times to make sure. Yes, it sounds very important. Mr Brown tried it out next. Follow me, <coughs> Paddington, he said. I'll take you to the snack bar. Mr Brown was as good as his word. Paddington had never seen so many snacks on one tray and he didn't know which to try first. He was so hungry and thirsty, he climbed upon the table to get a better look. Mr Brown turned away, pretending he had tea with a bear on Paddington Station every day of his life. It was quite normal. Henry, cried Mrs Brown when she arrived with Judy. What are you doing to that poor bear? Paddington jumped up to raise his hat and in his haste, he trod on a strawberry tart, skidded on the cream and fell over backwards into his cup of tea. I think we'd better go before anything else happens, said Mr Brown. Judy took hold of Paddington's paw. Come along, she said. We'll take you home and you can meet Mrs Bird and my brother Jonathan. Mr Brown led the way to a waiting taxi. Number 32, Windsor Gardens, please, he said. The driver stared at Paddington. Bears is extra, he growled. Sticky bears is twice as much. And make sure none of it comes off on my interior. It was clean when I set out this morning. The sun was shining as they drove out of the station and there were cars and big red buses everywhere. Paddington waved to some people waiting at a bus stop and several of them waved back. It was all very friendly. Paddington tapped the taxi driver on the shoulder. It isn't a bit like darkest Peru, he announced. Ugh, the man jumped at the sound of Paddington's voice. Cream! He said bitterly, cream and jam all over my coat. He slid the window shut behind him. Oh dear, Henry, murmured Mrs Brown. I wonder if we're doing the right thing. Fortunately, before anyone else had time to answer, they arrived at Windsor Gardens and Julie helped, Judy helped Paddington onto the pavement. Now you're going to meet Mrs Bird, she said. She looks after us. 
She's a bit fierce at times, but she doesn't really mean it. I'm sure you'll like her. Paddington felt his knees begin to wobble. I'm, I'm, I'm sure I shall if you say so, he replied. The thing is, will she like me? Goodness gracious, exclaimed Mrs Bird. What have you got here? It's not a what, said Judy. It's a bear called Paddington and he's coming to stay with us. A bear, said Mrs Bird, as Paddington raised his hat. Well, he has good manners, I'll say that for him. I'm afraid I stepped on a jam tart by mistake, said Paddington. Hmm, I can see that, said Mrs Bird. You'd better have a bath before you're very much older. Judy can turn it on for you. I dare say you'll be wanting some marmalade too. I think she likes you, whispered Judy. Well, Paddington had never been in a bathroom before, and while the water was running, he made himself at home. First of all, he tried writing his new name in the steam on the mirror. Then he used Mr Brown's shaving foam to draw a map of Peru on the floor. It wasn't until a drip landed on his head that he remembered what he was supposed to be doing. He soon discovered that getting into a bath is one thing, but it's quite another matter getting out again, especially when it's full of soapy water. Paddington tried calling out, Help! At first in a quiet voice, so as not to disturb anyone, then very loudly, Help! Help! When that didn't work, he began bailing the water out with his hat. But the hat had several holes in it, and his map of Peru soon turned into a sea of foam. Suddenly, Jonathan and Judy burst into the bathroom and lifted a dripping Paddington onto the floor. Oh, thank goodness you're all right, cried Judy. We heard you calling out. Fancy making such a mess, said Jonathan admiringly. You should have pulled the plug out. Oh, said Paddington, I never thought of that. When Paddington came downstairs, he looked so clean no one could possibly be cross with him. His fur was all soft and silky and his nose gleamed and his paws had lost all traces of the jam and cream. The Browns made room for him in a small armchair and Mrs Brown bought him a pot of tea and a plate of hot buttered toast and marmalade. Now, said Mrs Brown, you must tell us all about yourself. I'm sure you must have lots of adventures. I have, said Paddington earnestly. Things are always happening to me. I'm that sort of a bear. He settled back in the armchair. I was brought up by my Aunt Lucy in darkest Peru, he began. But she had to go into a home for retired bears in Lima. Hmm. He closed his eyes thoughtfully and a hush fell over the room as everyone waited expectantly. After a while, when nothing happened, they began to get restless. <coughs> Mr Brown tried coughing. Then he reached across and poked Paddington. <gasps> well, I never, he said. I do believe he's fast asleep. <laughs> After all that's happened to him, said Mrs Brown, is it any wonder? Hello, I'm Mrs Brooker and today I'm going to be reading Mr Muddle and Mr Muddle is written by Roger Hargreaves. Poor Mr Muddle just couldn't get anything right. Everything he did, everything he tried, everything he said was muddled. Totally, utterly, completely, absolutely muddled. Imagine, for instance, something as simple as hammering a nail into a wall now, what could get muddled with hammering a nail into a wall? Mr Muddle could get it muddled. And frequently he did. Imagine, for instance, something as simple as putting on your coat. Now, what could get muddled with putting on your coat? Well, see for yourself. Only Mr Muddle would put on a coat like that. Imagine, for instance, going for something as simple as a walk. Now, what could get muddled? about going for a walk. Well, when your legs start walking one way and you start walking the other, it's a very muddly sort of walk. Poor Mr Muddle, walking one way and going another. 
Now, you'd probably like to know where Mr. Muddle lives. He lives in a house by the sea near a place called Sea Town. Mr. Muddle's house was supposed to be in the country, but Mr. Muddle, who built the house himself, had got the place muddled up. Of course, and you can tell that Mr. Muddle had built the house himself, can't you? This story starts one afternoon when Mr. Muddle was having his breakfast. Yes, we know you don't have breakfast in the afternoon, but you do if you get your mealtimes muddled up. Mr. Muddle was having bread and butter and jam and a cup of tea with milk and sugar. He spread the butter on the table and then he spread the jam on the plate and then he poured the little milk on the bread and then filled the cup with sugar and then poured the tea on the bread. What a terribly mixed up, muddly breakfast. That afternoon after breakfast, he went for a walk down the beach near his house in order to work up an appetite for supper. He met an old fisherman called George, whom he knew quite well. Good afternoon, Mr. Muddle, said George. Good evening, replied Mr. Muddle. George smiled. How would you like to come fishing with me, he asked. Oh, no, please, replied Mr. Muddle eagerly. Help me push the boat out from the beach, called George. Right-o, said Mr. Muddle, and pulled the boat further up onto the beach. Oh, Mr. Muddle, said George, and he had to show Mr. Muddle the difference between pushing and pulling. However, eventually, somehow or other, they managed to get the boat out to sea. Now let's fish, said George, dropping a fishing line over the side of the boat. Right-o, said Mr. Muddle, and he dropped himself over the side of the boat. Splash! Oh, Mr. Muddle, said George again. It wasn't any good and they didn't catch any fish, so they decided to go home before it became dark. Help me to pull the boat up onto the beach, called George. Right-o, said Mr. Muddle, and pushed the boat back into the water. George was about to say, oh, Mr. Muddle, again, when he had an idea. He smiled to himself. Help me push the boat out into the sea, George called. Right-o, said Mr. Muddle and he pulled up the boat onto the beach. Well done, Mr. Muddle, said George. And Mr. Muddle smiled a smile and went home. George smiled a smile and went to tell everybody. The following day in Sea Town, Mr. Brick the Builder asked Mr. Muddle to hold his coat for him. Right-o, said Mr. Muddle, and he held the ladder for him, which was just what Mr. Brick really wanted. Well done, Mr. Muddle, smiled Mr. Brick, who'd been talking to George. Mr. Muddle was very pleased. Mrs. Scrub at the laundry asked Mr. Muddle to pass her the soap. Right-o, said Mr. Muddle, and he passed her the clothes pegs, which is what Mrs. Scrub really wanted. Well done, Mr. Muddle, she smiled, who'd also been talking to George. Mr. Muddle was extremely pleased. And then Mr. Black Coleman asked Mr. Muddle to lift a sack of coal down from his lorry. Right-o, said Mr. Muddle, and he lifted a sack of coal up onto the lorry, which is what Mr. Black had really wanted all along. Well done, Mr. Muddle, smiled Mr. Black. George had talked to everybody and Mr. Muddle was delighted. In fact, Mr. Muddle was so delighted, he decided to go home and cook himself a large meal to celebrate. Roast turkey and peas and potatoes and gravy. He put the turkey in the cupboard to cook. He peeled the peas. He put the potatoes in the refrigerator to boil. And then do you know what he did? He tried to slice the gravy. Oh, Mr. Muddle. Hello, my name's Mrs. Scott, and today I'm going to read The Queen's Knickers. The Queen likes to dress smartly. So she has an enormous wardrobe for her clothes and a slightly smaller chest of drawers for all her knickers. Dillis looks after the Queen's knickers. She has a special trunk for when the Queen goes away. One day, the trunk went missing. The Queen's knickers! The Queen's knickers! It caused a great crisis and was only just sorted out before it reached the news at 10. The trunk had got mixed up with a picnic hamper. 
the Queen has knickers for all occasions. Official HM knicker guide. Royal weddings, knickers for state funerals, horse riding with extra padding, foreign visits, garden parties, at home, Balmoral, which are woolen, and every day. At the opening of Parliament, the Queen wears her VIPs, very important knickers, or very important pair. There is no picture of these, but here is the safe where they're locked up with other state secrets. When she travels, she has special knickers with a small parachute inside. Pull cord, just in case. She has another pair for when she's on board ship, but her most special knickers are her Christmas knickers. They are a gift from Scandinavia and are traditionally decorated with real holly, which is why she keeps her Christmas message very short. The royal knickers, though they are her most valuable, they are made of pure silk with gold thread and encrusted with diamonds, emeralds and rubies. They were first worn by Queen Victoria and are rather baggy. I wonder what knickers the Queen would wear if she visited our school. There'd be a terrific flap at the palace. Call the royal knicker maker, Dillis. Oh no, too, too fancy. Oh no, far too frilly. Oh no, far too plain. Oh no, far too silly. I shall just have to wear my everyday knickers. Then the poor queen would feel very awkward as she's so particular about her clothes. But I would tell her something to put her at ease. Don't worry about your knickers, your majesty, I'd whisper. You see, no one can see them anyway. Then she'd be sure to send a special note to me afterwards by the royal mail saying, Her Majesty wishes to inform you that her visit was very enjoyable and most comfortable. Hello, my name's Mrs. Cura, and today I'm going to be reading Wiffy Wilson, the wolf that wouldn't go to school. There was a wolf called Wilson. He couldn't count to ten. He wouldn't learn to write his name. He never used a pen. He didn't know his ABCs. He couldn't paint or cook. He wouldn't learn his two plus twos. And he never read a book. Time for school, his father cried. You pesky little pup. But school is boring, Wilson whined and turned the telly up. One morning, Wilson went next door to ask a friend to play. But Dotty smiled. I can't because I'm off to school today. Well, I'm not going, Wilson grumped. Who wants to read and write? I'd rather play and watch TV and stay up late all night. Oh, you're so silly, Dotty smiled. Come to school with me. There's nothing to be scared of. School's lots of fun, you'll see. Who says I'm scared, growled Wilson. A wolf is brave and strong. It's just the teacher might be cross if I get the answers wrong. But Dotty wasn't worried. She grabbed him by the paw. She marched him up the path to school and pushed him through the door. She hung his coat upon a peg. She made him use the loo, then took him to the classroom and showed him what to do. First, you paint a picture and stick it on the wall. And then you get some biscuit dough and roll it in a ball. You squeeze it and you squash it. You pat it nice and flat. Then you get some biscuit cutters and make a shape like that. Next, you'll get the ladybirds and count up all the spots. And then we'll draw a picture 
by joining all the dots. At lunchtime they had pizza, they ran to play outside. Let's play football, called a boy. My favourite, Wilson cried. He ran and passed and dribbled. Then he scored a goal. Hooray! His team cheered. Whiffy Wilson, you're the hero of the day. I thought no one would like me, said Wilson with a grin. But look at all my lovely friends. It's great fun joining in. It's messy time that afternoon. They made a flying car. What lovely work, the teacher smiled. You've earned a golden star. This isn't work, gasped Wilson. All we've done so far is play. Oh, you're so funny, Dotty laughed. We've been working hard all day. But the day was nearly over, so they sat down on the rug. The teacher read a story and Wilson gave his friend a hug. This school is perfect, Wilson grinned. It isn't dull at all. I can play with all the other kids and I can run and kick a ball. The classroom toys are really cool. The teacher is so kind. If I had to come here every day, I really wouldn't mind. Next morning, Whiffy Wilson was up and dressed by eight. He called for Dotty straight away. It's school, we can't be late. Oh, Whiffy Wilson, Dotty smiled. You really are the best. There's no school on Saturday. It's time to have a rest. But home is boring, Wilson whined. I want to go and play. What can I do? Just stay inside and watch TV all day? Never mind, smiled Dotty. You can come and play with me. So they ran around the garden as happy as can be. Well, hi, I'm the year two class teacher, Mr. McBean. And I'm going to read Gordon's Got a Snooky by Lisa Shanahan. One evening, the animals of the zoo could not sleep. Gordon is coming, cried the giraffe to the tiger. Gordon is coming, roared the tiger to the seal. Gordon is coming, barked the seal to the yak. Gordon is coming, Gordon is coming, babbled the yak to the gnu. Whoopee, whoopee, yee-haw, yippity, woo-hee, Gordon is coming, Gordon is coming. The yak stopped dancing and gazed at the gnu. Uh, who is Gordon? he asked. Don't you know? asked the gnu. If I knew, asked the yak, would I be asking you? He's a gorilla, said the gnu. He's the new top boy. The big silver back. They're flying him in from a zoo overseas so that he can take care of the girls. Wee! said the yak. The girls were wide awake. The air was hot and steamy. I hope he's big, said Gidget. I hope he's strong, said Doris. I hope he's hairy said Delilah. And eventually they fell asleep and dreamt lovely dreams about a big, strong, hairy gorilla. The next morning, the gorillas met Gordon for the first time. Gordon grinned at the girls. He flexed his pecs. He bulged his biceps. He pummeled his chest and he roared, Roar! Ooh, he's big, said Gidget. Ooh, he's strong, said Doris. Oh, he's hairy, said Delilah. But the baby gorillas laughed and laughed. Look, screeched Abu, the smallest gorilla. Gordon's got a snooky. Gordon's got a snooky. Gordon's got a snooky? cried the giraffe to the tiger. Gordon's got a snooky, roared the tiger to the seal. Gordon's got a snooky, barked the seal to the yak. Gordon's got a snooky, babbled the yak to the gnu. Gordon's got a snooky, boo-hoo, <laughs> The yak stopped dancing and gazed at the gnu. What's a snooky? he whispered. Don't you know? asked the gnu. 
Well, if I knew, hissed the yak, would I be asking you? A snooky, said the canoe, is a cuddly, a comforter, a blanky blanky. What do you use it for? asked the yak. Well, you carry it with you wherever you go, said the canoe. And whenever you feel lonely or scared or you miss your mummy, you hug it tight. Oh, you are in the know, said the yak. The animals laughed themselves silly over Gordon and his Snooky. The hyena laughed so much he was carted off to hospital. The gorillas were embarrassed and ashamed. Do you want to squeeze my muscles? Gordon asked. No, thanks, mumbled Gidget. What about we go for a climb? Gordon called. Not today, muttered Doris. My coat could do with a bit of nitpicking, Gordon beamed. I'm not hungry, sighed Delilah. And they turned their backs on Gordon and ignored him. Gordon could not understand it. He tried his best, but before long, he was the loneliest animal in the whole zoo. And the lonelier he became, the harder he hugged his Snooky. And the harder he hugged his Snooky, the more the other animals laughed. And the more the other animals laughed, the more the other gorillas ignored him. And the more the other gorillas ignored him, the lonelier he became. And the lonelier he became, of course, the harder he hugged his Snooky. Soon, he was so lonely, he couldn't move. One morning, while Gordon was sleeping, a boo fell into the moat. Aye! screamed the boo. Mama! But the water was deep and dark. And even the biggest and strongest gorillas can't swim. Mama, cried Abu. Mama! Gidget stretched out a stick. Doris held out a branch. Delilah tossed in a piece of rope. But nothing could reach the smallest gorilla. Mama! Help! wailed Abu's mother. Help! Gordon woke up. When he saw Abu thrashing in the water... Something inside him boiled. Rawr, he roared. Rawr. He leapt to his feet. He snatched up his snooky. With a mighty rip, he tore it into two. He tied the pieces together and swung it into the moat. Grab the snooky, cried Gordon as one end smacked into the water. Grab the snooky, shouted the giraffe and the tiger. Grab the snooky, bellowed the seal and the gnu. Grab the snooky, gushed the gorillas. Why does he have to grab the snooky? asked the yak. Stop your yakety yak, said the gnu, and watch. Abu grabbed the snooky and Gordon dragged him in. As soon as Abu reached the bank, his mother hugged him tight. Gordon untied the snooky. And wrung it out, and then he wrapped a boo in the biggest piece. There you go, he said, wiping the tears from the smallest gorilla's eyes. The animals of the zoo were still and silent. Whippee woohoo! cheered the yak, suddenly dancing about. Whippee woohoo! cried the animals of the zoo. Yippity woohee! Gordon grinned. He flexed his pecs, he bulged his biceps, he pummeled his chest and he roared. You are so big, said Gidget. I want to squeeze your muscles. Oh, you're so strong, said Doris. I want to climb with you always. You are so hairy, said Delilah. I want to nitpick you forever. And from that day on, Gordon was never lonely again. And neither were any of the other animals. For whenever they felt lonely or scared or missed their mummies, they each hugged tight their very own Snooky. <laughs>